Well, hi, everybody, and welcome to episode 48 of Circle of Fellows. I'm Shell Holtz. I am director of internal communications at WebCore in San Francisco and your moderator for today. Um, I do have to say that when we last spoke with you in our July episode, I noted that YouTube was ending Hangouts on Air, the tool that we used to broadcast this, and we weren't sure what we were going to be doing. Uh, we found a new tool called StreamYard. Uh, it's a not free like Hangouts on Air from YouTube was, uh, but I guess you get what you pay for because this is awesome. I mean, the capabilities of this thing are really good. Not only does it allow us to do what we did before on YouTube, but you can choose to broadcast to Facebook instead and uh, other places. And uh, there's a lot of different options uh, available here, the way we configure the screen and the like. Uh, and so far we like it. Uh, we hope that it works for those of you watching on uh, YouTube. And I can actually see how many of those there are. Uh, so that's a feature that we had lost on Hangouts on Air. So uh, we're very pleased to be able to continue doing this as a general broadcast to anybody who wants to be able to watch, uh, to be able to continue to do it through YouTube so that we can share the recording with you uh, afterwards and folks can watch at their leisure. So thank you for joining us. Um, today's theme is all around the changing media landscape and how to maintain uh, a strategic alignment with the goals of your communication effort and the support that you're providing for your clients or your uh, employer uh, as the media landscape shifts beneath our feet. And we have three IABC fellows Joining me today, uh, Cindy Schmieg was on the roster, but was ill this morning and had to bow out. But I suspect we can fill the time with the three that we have. Uh, I'm going to ask you all to introduce yourselves as I see you on the thumbnail at the bottom of the screen, starting with Brad. Hi, I'm Brad Whitworth. I am a senior internal communications ma uh, manager at a company called Hitachi Vantara in Silicon Valley. Uh, Long-time IABC type, and uh, pleased to be able to join the team today. Great. Uh, next is John. Hi, John Devaney with Devaney. We're a marketing consulting firm in New Orleans and West Palm Beach, Florida. Uh, happy to be with you today, Shell. Happy you're here with us too. And Stacy. I'm Stacy Wilson uh, with Alcor Consulting, based out of Denver, working with clients all over the world to help them drive more uh, communication and collaboration with their technology. Excellent. And uh, as I uh, always like to mention, we will be taking your questions in pretty close to real time. All we need is for you to submit those questions over Twitter using the hashtag COF48. That's for Circle of Fellows number 48. And uh, Usually I come back about every 15 minutes and say that, but now that StreamYard gives me the ability to do this overlay, you can see it there in the bottom right of your screen the whole time. So I don't think I'll be interrupting the flow of the conversation quite as frequently with that, but we hope that you will ask questions. Uh, but let's get started with the topic that we're here to discuss today. And I, I thought I'd start by just asking as we go around the panel, what you think the biggest changes are right now, uh, either happening now or that you're anticipating in the very near term future uh, that is going to change the way we produce and distribute content or, or media. Um, and, and John, let me, let me start with you. Sure. I think the, the two biggest changes are at opposite ends of, of what's happening. One is the, the growth and the expansion of types of media and outlets and opportunities. Um, there's some great examples. Nextdoor, I think, is a, has already proven itself um, as an example that consumers can latch on to media channels and outlets and really uh, bend them to their will and use them so successfully. So Nextdoor is one that we're really seeing. Um, it's a type of micro community coverage uh, it really does, it, it takes the form of a media outlet because 
uh, consumers are turning to it for information. They're turning to it as a credible source. Um, and so having campaigns that tap into that are important. And the the other change is really the the other end. It's it's the shrinking, the 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 dissolving or maybe the erosion, for example, of, of journalism. One of the real challenges that we're seeing is that there are fewer and fewer uh, trained in, in programs for journalism and with experience in journalism leading these outlets. You know, we uh, one of our clients had a really unfortunate situation where there is a, a quasi credible media outlet and what we saw was uh, some really what we would call poor journalism. Not only was there not um, fact checking or uh, an approach that was objective or seeking truth, but the worst part about it, it, it was a you know a D level media outlet, but it got picked up by TV stations and newspapers in seven major markets across the country. And what they did was they rebroadcast and republished things that were not facts. In fact, the, the truth of it was things that were untrue and had been documented as untrue and were uh, damaging. And we're seeing that. So I see both some opportunity in the growth of outlets, but I also see some some opportunity where we're needed as practitioners to help resolve problems where um, there's a, a contraction in outlets. Yeah, it's interesting. Just a couple of years ago, I remember there was a story, I think it was uh, about a, a, a shooting in Texas uh, that spread through mainstream media like wildfire. Uh, it turned out the original story wasn't true. And when editors at the various publications that ran it were asked why they didn't fact check it, they said, well, we assumed that the source publication fact checked it. Right. Uh, so that, this that's thing. That situation yeah. that, that we faced last month for a client, Shell. And it was major five major markets, um, two B level markets across the country reprinting uh, untruths. Right. Uh, Stacy, I know that you're focused on internal communication. What what are you seeing or anticipating as a, a big change to the environment that might change the way you advise your clients communicate? Well, obviously, technology has had a tremendous impact on the internal side. Um, it, it, but I think it it's not just in the way that we might think about technology. It, it really allows us to drive more collaboration. And so, so one of the big changes I, I think is important to recognize is that communicate as communicators, we need to embrace our responsibility for collaboration, not just delivering messages, but creating dialogue, not necessarily between our messaging and others, but to, to help others across the organization to communicate more effectively. So I'll give you a couple of examples really quick. Um, with one of our healthcare clients, and, and we actually find this problem with lots of healthcare organizations, uh, their social work teams at the different facilities within the system tend not to communicate with each other. They're all out in the community trying to identify community resources for their patients and families, but they don't share that with each other. So one of the things that we've done is to introduce collaboration opportunity with uh, within the larger uh, social worker part of the organization so that they are not recreating that wheel all the time. Um, another great example is with one of our uh, global mining organizations connecting some of their highly specialized engineers at the different mine sites to uh, work with each other to, to tackle problems and support each other, whereas before they, they didn't even know each other's names. They, they never communicated with each other at all. So I think this is a really important thing for communicators to be doing is to identify those opportunities where if you create better collaboration in the organization, you're, you're creating higher pro productivity. Yeah, but I have to share a Sorry, go ahead. I, was, I, was just, I have to share a story uh, on, on that topic. I was uh, working with Tudor Williams and Annette Martell and a few other people on a big project. And we were in a flagship store of a, a, a big global 
retail chain. And uh, we were asking how innovative they were allowed to be. And they said, oh, it's in the DNA of the company. For example, we were told that the products that were in the newspaper circular were not selling well. So we created a display at the front of the store of the actual products. We uh, you know, just sort of twist tied them to this pegboard so the people walking in the front door could see the products, not pictures of them, but the real things. Uh, and we had a 20% increase in, in sales of products. And I said, wow. that's, that's, that's fantastic. How did you tell people in other stores about that? And they said, how did we do what now? <laughs> right. Right. Um, Stacy, yeah. can I Stacy, can I ask you something? Uh -huh. um, with the especially when you're looking at internal audiences and collaboration, do, do you find it it really makes an impact their use of online resources or lack thereof? Is it something you gauge, or do you, is collaboration? Do you look at more how they collaborate in real time and not look at their usage of online resources? Well, from a measurement perspective, John, we, we would definitely look at usage and particularly with um, all the social technologies, we want to look at activity and understand, um, you know, what does that activity look like, which users in, in the user base are doing different kinds of activities, because not everyone will do everything, right? Some people comment, but they won't author. Other people will, will author, but they won't comment. So, you know, we need to understand that dynamic in the user base. Um, so definitely we're still looking at that, but we're also looking at, at lots of other things. And one, I mean, that's a really good question because one of the things that we see is we tend to make assumptions about certain populations of employees, that they're not savvy, that they're not technical users, which hands down in almost every single uh, client has been wrong, um, including those miners who are working in the pit just because they're not allowed to have their phone in the pit does not mean that they're not right on their smartphone doing Facebook as soon as they get out of the, the pit. So it's that kind of observation that's really important uh, to understand what those usage patterns are, but also talking to them about what are the challenges that they're having. That's usually yeah. how we find out about those small little things that collaboration can help with. I've also that found that there are employees who willfully violate the policy that says you can't take the phone in the pit because they have found ways to use it for work purposes. Yeah. And the work that Stacy's doing is so crucial. I can't think of a single instance where um, being able to generate or, or spark more collaboration among a team or a group of people um, isn't going to be absolutely something that drives straight to the bottom line. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And that's part of why I, I tended to focus more and more on that over time, because it does drive to the bottom line. Um, to Shell's point, though, depending on the organization, Shell, there are valid safety reasons. Why oh, sure. They're not supposed to take their, their device with them. But you're absolutely right that there are other situations where in the absence of other better technology for them to collaborate, sometimes they will use their smartphone when they're not supposed to. Healthcare is a classic example of that. The nurses on the unit floors are typically using their smartphones if they don't have another more secured way, but, but we really don't want them sharing patient information across their smartphones. So they need to be provided with a more secure way to have that conversation. Yep. Brad, you've been waiting very patiently. Well, no, I, I was gonna say, it's very interesting to hear the, the Stacy's and John's comments, because I think it sort of reflects on some of the things that I've been thinking about. One is, this whole blurring between internal and external, it's a trend we've seen for many, many years. And I think it's just becoming exacerbated with the technology and its infusion. Um, the idea of people becoming social ambassadors, taking external stuff and sharing it internally, and sometimes knowingly and sometimes unknowingly taking internal things and passing externally. So that clear silo wall is definitely dissolving and has been. The other interesting thing to me, which comes along with sort of the demise of some of the major outlets and this proliferation of other media outlets here, there, and elsewhere, some marvelous and some of of lesser quality, uh, I think puts a burden of, on us to be a little bit more aware of the landscape. I mean, it used to be quite simple. Um, you know, in the corporate setting, if you landed a uh, press release in Business Week or got a, a front cover in Fortune or Forbes or landed the New York Times or the LA Times or AP, it was a success. I mean, you, you had done a masterful job. 
Now there are just so many different places and each one is probably equally unimportant. They have different followings. We need to be on top of that. I remember when I was covering Asia Pacific and Latin America, the idea of you know not reading Business Week, Fortune, Forbes, and sort of that New York, Washington-based stream of news, but to make sure that I, as the communications person, was following all the other media, that's a whole lot easier today. I mean, I actually have on my cell phone things that I don't read all that often, but you know, things like the uh, you know, financial review, um, uh, The Economist, certainly I've got the Le Monde from Paris that I pick up and read occasionally. So finding ways to read what others are saying about you and your organization as opposed to just that sort of narrow band of places where we were accustomed to. All that's tied into what we've also hinted upon, which is um, in increasing amounts of, I'll call it user generated content. And that's true whether it's inside an organization or sort of in the outside world, um, instead of the trained journalists being the ones who are providing stuff, it's sort of become everyone's job to be able to be a junior reporter. And they're the ones that don't have that skill set, who don't know how necessarily to do the fact checking, who, you know, when they're doing interviews, like, hey, how do you feel about, and just shove a microphone under somebody's nose. Uh, um, along with, you know, the, the plus is that we're getting some amazing footage from some places that, you know, would have taken hours for a film crew to get out there. So, you know, I think there's pluses and minuses to it. Uh, we're in the middle of the, hmm, how do we cope with all of this stuff? And I think the, the real question sometimes is, what is the role of the communications person, be they exclusively internal, exclusively external, or in some sort of corporate, how do we deal with this larger communications environment that's uh, shifting sands at this point? Uh, yeah, and in terms of that notion of user-generated content and uh, the role it can play, in promoting advocacy. Uh, John, you were talking about Nextdoor. Uh, I'm an avid user of Nextdoor uh, in my community. And what I find, yeah, I, I find about half of it is I found a lost cat or, uh, gee, there was a rattlesnake. That's my cat, backyard. Shell. Pardon? That's my cat. That's your cat? <laughs> okay, that's the cat with the mustache? Uh, yes. <laughs> um, but the other half is, can somebody recommend a veterinarian? Can somebody recommend uh, a great restaurant to, to try? In fact, I just responded to a restaurant request yesterday with my favorite place um, near us. Uh, and I'm, I'm wondering, John, as, as you work with clients, how do you sort of work your way into those conversations that seem to be very organic give and take among members in the community? Well, one thing, Shell, is there's there's great research that documents how important that user-generated content is. In fact, there's two different um, scholarly works, one that looks at cancer and one that looked at HIV and AIDS. And what they found was that online, we give no, that users give no greater credibility to certified experts than they do anonymous user-generated content. Um, which I found, which I find really disturbing. The fact that we will trust, you know, Joe and Mary six pack online equally with an oncologist or radiologist. Um, but the research tells us that it's true. And so um, that's powerful to know how significant that user generated content is. And it's also helpful because we bring that to clients and point out that um, we need to have um, significant, robust campaigns that that really attract and harness and focus user-generated content, and we've had great success with that. Um, there's also there's also challenges. You know, you will get um, trolls. You'll get people that jump on board, and and some that really try and disrupt the apple cart just to see if they if they can. But what your experience looking at next door is that we want. You know, we want that that neighbor that gives us a credible recommendation of what to do. And we're looking for credible information. Um, and so that's where we look at for user generated content. And I imagine, Stacy, that's what that's some of the power that you harness and focus all the time among internal audiences, because peer to peer solicitation has has always been and, and will continue to be the most successful, the most powerful sort of 
um, solicitation or or certification or recommendation that happens. So it's something that we need to do. It's also why bloggers and now influencers are such a focus for our work. Um, and where, you know, when influencers really, the advent of, of using influencers, it was more the celebrities in the media, the top of that pyramid of influencers, where the Katie Kirk or the Kim Kardashian um, was the, the brass ring that you wanted to get. And then it moved on to people that are, it, they do it for a living and you select them based on the audience that they have. We're seeing, and we're doing more and more for clients with micro influencers, or really looking within their audience base. Who are people that are part of their audience that happen to have reach and credibility with a good sized audience that's important to the client? So it's that you know user generated content in that term has really morphed into influencers. Yeah, and influencers I read about probably more than any other dimension of media these days. Uh, in fact, there are people who are now pretending to be paid influencers. Uh, I read about this, I think it was in Atlantic. Uh, they are pretending that uh, they're going out to an event, pretending that they are paid by a brand to influence in hopes of building up the audience and grabbing the attention so that they can become paid influencers. I also read that the number one thing that kids in China want to grow up to be is an astronaut, and the number one thing that kids in America want to grow up to be is an online influencer, which is uh, a, a little worrying. Yeah. Uh, in some ways, it's just a throwback. It's um, you know people who created fake press credentials to gain access to something, to be able to or take photos or whatever. This is just sort of the next spin on that same thing. I think it does bring up a real interesting question, though, is the how do we uh, say train the consumers of all of this information, be it internal or external, to be um, critical thinkers and to be able to you know, look at this stuff and suss out, you know, what is the truth? Is this a source that I trust? More than, um, I, I have a sense that oftentimes it's more like the, uh, the Facebook friends. You end up um, following the stuff that makes you feel good, but may not necessarily have anything to do with fact versus fiction. And I'm not sure it's a skill set that's being taught to uh, a lot of people in school these days is that whole critical thinking, analysis, look for the divergent opinions, um, seek them out, um, seek to expand your knowledge and, and go broader instead of uh, just resonating with the, the one that seems to have a good vibe. You know, I, what, what we're seeing is the, the keys to success for uh, influencer marketing, content marketing that uses influencers are and it, it's a bit surprising or it's not, you know, it goes back to that adage of measure twice and cut once, but the most important uh, effort in influencer marketing is the three steps of identifying what influencers you may want to engage with, vetting out to make sure that you really narrow and select the right ones. And then the third step is negotiating how this, how this campaign is going to work, what you expect from them, how you're going to work together. And what we're seeing is if you get those three steps right, if you identify, vet, and negotiate well with influencers, then honestly, the, it's going to be a successful campaign. And if you don't, then it's re really a crapshoot. So if I can add to kind of the internal perspective, um, you know, John, to, to what you just, just said, um, one of the things that we, we try to do is identify people inside the organization who are not necessarily influencers, but have a lot of knowledge. So we see this a lot in certain industries where their population of experts is aging and, and they're approaching retirement. And we just don't have a lot of people in that middle range. Um, and so the younger incoming startup folks need, need to um, have a way to capture the knowledge uh, before it walks out the door. So identifying those folks and giving them a platform and opportunity to start to share with, with um, the others who are interested in the organization, their knowledge, it's a really important way for us to capture that knowledge in the organization before they leave. Um, and another one, I'll, I'll harken back, John, to what you said earlier, is um, we, we know that, that employees like to actually learn new things from other employees. Uh, there, there's pretty sound research around that. 
So we actually will try, particularly when, when we're working with the client to roll out a new intranet or digital workplace, to engage some of those more savvy, capable employees to do some of the training material videos in particular um, as part of that overall training package because employees you know, really like to see, even if it's not an, a familiar face, if it's a larger organization, they like to know that, oh, hey, that that's the manager of so-and-so over in Singapore. And that's really cool that they're teaching me how to do this new thing. I want to share a comment that's uh, come uh, across uh, from Twitter from Bill Spaniel, uh, former president of IABC Los Angeles, longtime IABC member, uh, says, I subscribe to Nextdoor, but I don't put much credence in it. Um, he doesn't say why. Uh, I find, you know, people push their agendas sometimes on next door, but also I remember people were complaining uh, they were going to increase the speed limit on a street near us that's already pretty dangerous. And the community came together to oppose it, figured out when the city council meeting was, pushed that, uh, went out and uh, sort of defeated that initiative. And we were able to keep the speed limit at, it's already 45. <laughs> so uh, it was, was pretty effective. John, do you see any particular reason? I mean, I, I think there's good reason to be skeptical of a lot of what you see online, but how, I, I don't want to spend too much time on next door, but, but how would you approach that? Um, absolutely. You, you, everyone should be skeptical, not just of next door, but anything they see online. And sadly, we need to be skeptical of what we see even in traditional media because they're lifting stories from questionable sources as well. And, and they don't have the staff at, or sometimes the staff they have don't even know about fact checking the way we have relied on and expected. But it doesn't surprise me at all. Um, I think we should expect that next door, you know, it, it's almost an empty vessel and it's what the individual community does with it and uses it. So if we're looking for a traditional media analogy, you know, there were some, there were some markets or cities that had great daily papers and there were others that, that didn't, you know, I think next door um, is, is harder to forecast, but it really is all about the community and how they're using it. Um, the content they're putting in the, the way they approach it. Um, some neighborhoods, are really dedicated and focused on it, that they want it to be a reliable, credible source. And so they make sure what they're doing with it delivers that expectation. And then there's gonna be other communities that don't engage with it in the same way. And so it's going to be a far weaker end product or resource. John. Sorry, go ahead, Brad. I was just, I'm delighted to see uh, some traditional folk getting involved in it too. Uh, I know in our next door that uh, law enforcement will post something, whether it's about, uh, you know, we're going through a drill on this, and so don't be alarmed if, or, you know, there's a, um, a, a set fire that we're using for practice, so don't be alarmed. So I think sometimes those participation activities by known sources lends a little bit of credibility, but I, I do like this, you know, um, please be skeptical of a lot of the stuff. And that's where it gets back to that, you know, are you thinking critically about that? The other thing that I'm hearing from sort of the, the entire group is this uh, notion of our job is, is moving away from, I'll call it sort of just production of stuff and jamming it into channels that mm -hmm. we knew um, to becoming more astutely aware of the entire environment, seeing how the dots are connected, whether it is from something that has been long-standing and trusted to the stuff that is almost in that micro communications aspect that we didn't have to worry about. We were really focused on the mass. You know, we wanted to take stuff and cram it out into the broadest circulation publications and you know, to a all employee audience. And what we're finding is we also need to worry about the micro, not just the macro. So I'm hearing that as a, a trend that everybody's focusing on. Right. And just, just with um, next door, you know, we recently had a, a hurricane here in New Orleans. It was a category one. So um, we have those for breakfast. It's not a big deal. But, you know, what was so great about next door um, as a tool and as a resource was you weren't just getting information on you. You weren't trying to sift through information on an entire city, but you could get 
you know, that, that micro reporting and you could get credible real time information and you could do it with sources or resources that you could tap into immediately. Yeah, Bill points out that uh, next door, too many people post requests for cheap contractors or rant about trivial things, uh, <laughs> which yeah, I do definitely see that. Uh, you talk about going toward the micro. I think one of the shifts that we're seeing in the media landscape is personalization, uh, is that the communication now comes directly to you, which is as opposite of mass as you can get. And this is being facilitated by uh, artificial intelligence in, in some cases. Uh, I was just reading yesterday that the, uh, the, the uh, facial recognition software that's being developed, I, I don't remember if it's Amazon or Facebook or Microsoft, which one of them, but they can now detect fear uh, in that, which means how far the way from detecting curiosity or interest or um, disgust or, or what have you, and being able to fire out a communication to you based on exactly what they're seeing. Uh, certainly you can detect that in sentiment analysis in, in words. Uh, but even on a, a, a larger scale, the, uh, I mean, you know, personalization at some level is not new. We've been getting benefit statements for decades that show us our own benefits. But the ability to get an article delivered to you, say, over the Internet based on who you are, where you work, and what you have signaled that you are interested in takes that level of pushing information to somebody to a whole new level, too, doesn't it? Absolutely, Shell. Yeah, and, and and I mean, really, we we think of that as as user control. We want to give them control over their experience as much as we can. Um, and and some of those things they can't control because it, you know we're we're controlling it in the the background. But there's definitely opportunity for users to to individually select on everything down to a document if they want to track. Uh, you know, changes to a, an individual document or observe the posts of individual other employees in the organization. Um, one thing that I want to add on to is, is this idea of micro focus definitely is one of the things that we try to do with business process. We're looking for business processes in the organization that are maybe really small, but really frustrating for a lot of employees. And if we can fix those make them more efficient, um, that, that has a, a really significant productivity and, and frankly satisfaction effect in, in the organization. Um, so we're, we're always looking for those processes that we can help with. And, and one of the other reasons for that is that it's actually the task completion that drives internet adoption more than the content. You know, we all like to think that content is king and on an internal basis, it's, it's really not. It's the, I have to do my job, I have to complete certain tasks, that will drive me to adopt and use more. And I'm certainly going to consume content along the way, but we need those tasks to, to get us there every day. And, you know, I'd, I'd like to be the, Stacy offered the very um, appropriate and positive and forward thinking way of personalization and how it can be leveraged. And if Circle of Fellows can register fear, then I'm probably lighting up right now because I want to offer the counterbalance. Um, I'm, you know, I think this personalization approach has, has real threats and pitfalls for us. You know, it, it, it has, it gives people the opportunity to move away from just being into a bubble to forming almost a steel dome that I'm only going to be exposed to. I'm only going to hear things that are congruent in alignment with what I think the world is. Um, and and, and that concerns me. That that I think is a real drawback because we are a global community and we need to be open to ideas that have never struck us before, and um, cultures and activities and ideas and thoughts and positions that are absolutely contrary to anything we've held or we've thought. And so. And I, well, where personalization gives us power, and I think Stacy outlined appropriately the positive ways that that can be leveraged and used. I have a concern because I don't know that um, I don't know that that all of our cultures and all of us, and I'll name me first, have have evolved to the point where we should do that. You know, 
it's important that we are exposed to and hear different and opposing ideas. And even more important is that all of our cultures are ones where a diversity of ideas are welcome and that inclusion of thought, um, as well as all the other forms of inclusion um, are the heart of what we're doing because that's where true strength and growth and forward movement happens. So John, the nice thing is on the internal side, we we never would give them 100% control. We ne would never give employees that whole internal stakeholder group 100% control. So we do have that luxury, whereas on the external side, you don't. Right. So, and so that is a, into yeah. different categories of content would never choose benefits, which means they would never know when open enrollment is starting. Uh, but I'm thinking in terms of marketing, for example, and I believe this example came up last month. I can't remember the context, but using, I think, WhatsApp, there is a jeweler that makes bespoke jewelry items. And what you can do is once you've placed an order for a custom piece of jewelry is every day they share a photo with you of the progress on making that piece of jewelry. It's not mass. Uh, it, it's just for you. I know that Warby Parker, uh, the eyeglass company, uh, used to. I don't know that they're doing this anymore, but if you sent them a question, uh, whether it was over Twitter or by email, they did a video on YouTube to give you the answer. It was a minute or two long. Uh, they posted it to the uh, Warby Parker customer service channel, sent you the link, but now that answer was also there for anybody else who was interested in that particular question. So I, you know, I think in a lot of ways, this, this tailoring content to an individual from a marketing standpoint has, has a lot of potential, a lot of power. I think one How of the jewelry for Michelle coming along. Are you enjoying seeing the pictures of its development, Michelle? <laughs> yes, yes. It's, it's been in development for a long time. It's a huge piece. I think one of the things she that deserves you, it. you hit upon too is this uh, sort of the technology is evolving so quickly. Um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, whatnot. Our technology friends who are developing it love to roll it out, but they don't necessarily think of some of the applications beyond that one use case. Um, you know, they see it solving a particular problem, and I think it's up to us of the, how do you actually integrate this in with all of the other channels slash tools that are available? You know, is this replacing this? Is it supplementing? You know, how do you? And there are the scary implications. I think you mentioned artificial intelligence being able to, or facial recognition being able to be done um, and determining moods. I, I read a piece in the last couple of days that talked about some facial recognition software that looked at a group of legislators. I can't remember, I think it was a state legislature and identified based upon uh, stereotyped faces that 26% were likely criminals. It's like, well, that could be, but um, probably not. <laughs> So you know, I think the, the nascent technologies that we have, we're going to have to help figure out the how best to use them. And in some ways we may be, again, in that uh, sort of awkward position of the, you know, who, who made us as communications people in charge of some of the how this stuff is rolled out and who do we partner with on these things? Um, you know, our friends in legal may end up being some really good allies to how do you put this stuff in place so it is used, but used properly, whether it's, um, you know, HIPAA regulations that we have to worry about or GDPR stuff in terms of privacy, you know, we're going to be facing a whole set of, of moral issues and social issues above and beyond just the communications skill sets that we have to know. And I think it's going to be that partnership and the learning on our part, as well as the human nature. How do we get people to adopt and embrace and use these tools wisely? And, and do we and our colleagues know that that's the role that we need to play? You know, there, there's a whole field of study of bioethic, bioethicists, and bioethicists are there to help us um, and help the sciences make good decisions about not just can this be done, but should it be done, and, and what are the ramifications? I, I can't think of, of any comparable study or position that does that for information, communication, marketing. Not yep. yet. Maybe it's a new division of Devony. There you go. The other thing I would add to what Brad said is um, we also need to, to make sure that, that we're providing guidance around how to integrate all of this these new pieces 
with some of the kind of more traditional and, and how some of those traditional maybe change. And the one in particular that I would call out is leader led communication, whether that's at the frontline supervisor level, manager, director, how, you know, whatever level we're talking about. Um, we, we need to help those folks understand how does the communication they do with their teams integrate with all of these other newfangled approaches and, and how can they be reinforcing those with their teams and should be making them part of the expectation of how people get their work done to, to a certain extent. How do you, I mean, just to get really fundamental here for a minute, how do you even stay on top of all of the new platforms and channels? Uh, I remember when social media was brand new, it was blogs. The blogs were social media. Uh, then you saw things like uh, Friendster, um, come along in MySpace, and now we have Facebook. But I remember when people would say, uh, you know, between my blog and uh, LinkedIn and Twitter, I'm maxed out on the bandwidth I have available to monitor this and to contribute to it. You know, these days, uh, for a lot of companies, if you're not on Instagram, you're invisible uh, to an, an awful lot of people. How do you stay up and how do you manage to adopt the channels and the platforms that you need to to reach your audiences when it's just this exploding number of them? I go to the IBC World Conference and go to Shell Holtz's <laughs> section and uh, learn from him what the new technologies are that we need to be following. Uh, I, I can tell you what's new. I can't tell you how to do that on top of the 18 other that you're already doing. I mean, I know that there are social media management systems like Hootsuite and, and Sprinkler and the like that can be very helpful. Part of the problem there is you're blasting the same message out across multiple channels where I just saw a study of millennials that talked about how they use social media. And it was very clear. I use Instagram for this. I use Facebook for that. Uh, you know, uh, I use Snapchat for this other thing. Uh, but they're not just going to three to see who's there and what's on. They have different uses for, for each, for each platform. And, and, you know, our utilization of them has to be different as well. If you, in fact, take the same message or the same image and blast it out in all of them, really the outcome that you're going to get is you will lose followers in some of them. Because why would I follow your, why would I follow your Instagram if it's the same thing I'm going to see on your other channels? So right. um, that that can't happen. So when we're developing content calendars for clients, you know, we may want it may be the same topic or the same message but it has to be delivered somewhat differently, which is which is appropriate. You know, it, the formats are different, but you don't want to lose audience. You want to gain audience. So you have to be responsive to that. We know that's how they're consuming it. Um, and that's how we have to treat those channels. And you're right, Shell, using those um, listening tools is a great way to see what's coming next and what's, what's coming up. Um, and then also, uh, you really see it's the utilization and, and certain early adopters are, are great uh, bellwethers to what's happening. And I think that's an interesting, again, sort of new twist. And we've always sort of had that responsibility of doing audience analysis whenever we tackle a communications effort, whether it be internal or external. Um, now I just think we need to start thinking, again, we've hit upon this micro audiences and do we really need to hit the everybody kind of a mass audience or is is that the way to achieve whatever business goal that we have in mind? And I think more often than not, the answer is no. Incumbent upon us also is the education of those for whom we work, be it clients slash bosses, that um, not everybody needs everything shoved in their face in every channel. That's not the way to be successful. So we've got some educating that we need to do of the people who are paying the bills just so that they understand that, you know, um, yeah, I know why you're trying to do this, and I understand the, you would love to be able to have everybody, but we don't need to reach everybody. We need a target. We need to, you know, reach this group because they're the ones that uh, 80, 20, they're responsible, or they're the ones that are responsible for this, or they're the influencers. Somehow um, shift from the instant answer for a boss or for us was, oh, I'll put in a newsletter, I'll mass communicate, and it's all taken care of. And I think we've got other ways that we should go. So, 
I'm sorry. Go ahead, Stacey. Yeah. I, well, I was just going to add that uh, to follow up on, on Brad's comment about education, um, you know, the interesting thing about your question, Shell, is that on the internal front, the vast majority of organizations are not really willing to adopt a lot of these newer technologies internally right away. It, and and there are a variety of reasons for that, obviously. Um, but, you know, typically it takes a lot of education with the decision makers to get them comfortable um, with the idea. And, and best, I mean, you'll, you'll find that I don't use the term social media. Best to not use that because that is just a big red flag for them. But the other important aspect of this, I think, is on the internal side, we have to translate how that technology is really going to benefit the organization. And it, it will often be different from how the technology is used outside um, in, in the general mar marketplace. Um, and so we have to be really smart about how, how can we use this technology to solve a business problem inside um, to, to help you know create benefit for, for the employees. And, and that's going to be not only a big leverage point, but sometimes a, you know, a, a difficult sell if we can't figure it out. There are a lot of technologies that just, they, they're not going to help. Yeah. We, we have just launched, and it took a good year to get the approval for this, but um, for our external social media, which my department is responsible for, we have just launched a thing called Takeover Tuesdays on Instagram, where employees can raise their hand and say, I'd like to take over the account. Uh, and they sign uh, an agreement that they're going to abide by these rules and not do these things. I mean, one of the most important, especially if they're out on a construction project site, is don't show anything that isn't, you know, completely in line with our safety guidelines, uh, but also anything offensive. Uh, and so far, it's been great. It's a, a look at what a day in the life of an employee out on the job is. And since our Instagram account is really targeted toward um, recruiting, uh, we're hopeful that that's going to that really pay off. But it was something yeah, new and different. So convincing leaders that this was okay, that employees could, you know, broadcast out to the public was was going to be all right. John, you were saying? I, I just think that's a great idea, Shell. You know, you're you're constantly constantly reinvigorating the 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 pull to the to the channel and the audience. It's kind of an online guest bartender approach, right? Uh, uh, by the way, Bill says that uh, he'd go to his stakeholders and see what social media they use and then use the plat that platform to reach them. Uh, there are all kinds of new tools emerging right now. Uh, very interesting time uh, that I, I'm, I'm wondering about the value of experimentation, um, whether it's experimenting in public or just getting a personal account and trying this stuff out. Uh, I, I have been paying so much attention to TikTok lately. Uh, I still talk to communicators who haven't heard of it, um, but it's in the news every day, uh, either in terms of the, the numbers of users that it has, uh, its growth, uh, some of the issues that it's facing. Um, and, and yet, like I say, I, I, I talk to people who still haven't heard of it. It's going to overtake a lot of the social media that we take for granted these days. Uh, what is the value of experimentation? I think experimentation and piloting things may be our future um, and maybe the only way to go because the idea of determining that there's a one size fits all solution for all of the work groups within a corporation or all the constituent audiences that uh, an organization might have externally is probably a pipe dream. Um, the time that it takes to select a thing for a large organization and roll it out, I think sort of on the IT side of things of like an SAP implementation um, or you know some sort of new huge accounting slash expense software, it takes forever. And the answer is there are you know, apps that you can get that solve 90% of it for this group for their set of skills and needs. So I think um, the idea of 
let's grab that, let's play with it, let's try it in this area and see if it solves those needs. And then back to our earlier discussion of the how do you share those best practices amongst other groups who might have similar business needs is paramount as opposed to putting together committees and studying things and trying to do sort of a rollout across an entire organization. So yes, it's incumbent upon us as communications people to be out there on the bleeding edge, but I think you hit upon one where the, the the landscape is so broad that it's almost tough for any one person to do this. And I think what we need to do, uh, my thought is you find a, sort of, I'll say a, a caring committee, the people who are on that bleeding edge, the people who love to play, and you form your own little network, whether it's inside an organization or beyond the borders, and you start comparing notes. Have you looked at this? We thought about this. Those people are using that. So I think the, the people who are out there on the edge of the wedge need to be able to find ways to be able to share and compare, to be able to take care of that mainstream crowd that's gonna be following our lead and you know, the ones who aren't necessarily uh, sort of on the front edge of that bell-shaped curve of adoption rates. And the important thing that you mentioned, Brad, is communicating what you're doing with others. Mm -hmm. um, be because that we, we find, what it, particularly when we go into a larger organization that is global, has a variety of regions around the world, it, it, it's almost like each region is just working in their little bubble and, and they're using technology in different ways that, that are maybe really innovative and could be really helpful to all the other regions, but they're not telling anyone. So one of the things that we try to do is establish um, a way for them to share those successes or even the failures, right? Uh, we tried this, it didn't work. Maybe somebody else out uh, in, in another region has an idea uh, or tried something a different way already and it worked better. So we, we have to do a better job of helping the organization to communicate those um, so that we can leverage that all, all over. I'm I'm dying to use the screen share on StreamYard, so I'm gonna I'm gonna do that. You haven't shown off some of the technical capabilities of this brand new platform that we're using, and screen share is one. The other one that some people have been doing in the past is uh, you know whoever whoever spoke the loudest and most frequently would get that sort of full frame thing. And the good news is that uh, you know you're now in charge as the moderator. Right. Yeah, and I haven't done that for anybody. I could do. Well, I'll take advantage of that when we talk about uh, what's up on the share. This is called uh, Frame. Uh, this is a journalistic startup looking for a new way to get uh, some investigative research out there. Uh, this is, I, I'm actually a paying subscriber. I'm excited about this. It is focused on mobile, as you can tell from uh, the, the footprint of this thing. And, and basically, it's, and, yeah, we talk about the shifting media landscape, certainly. Uh, that's yeah, mobile is is right there. So this is designed to tap, and it can do the video. You are in absolute control. You notice up at the top here, you have these uh, little bars that looks a lot like an Instagram story or a Snapchat story. Uh, but you're in charge of when you go. Uh, and I'm just going to go through this to find. Then you get these things. It says tap to continue or take a detour to learn more about a dimension of this. So it's really taking advantage of that uh, mobile approach. And, you know, I, I, I like this a lot and, and I keep thinking, I'm going to stop the screen here. Uh, I keep thinking this would be awesome for internal communications to be able to deliver a story that an employee can get through in two or three minutes with their, their thumb and, and their phone. I don't know how they're doing it. I've put calls out to say, anybody have any idea how they're doing this? And the answer comes back, it must be proprietary. <laughs> uh, but you know, I think it's important to stay on top of these. Uh, something like this could be the next standard way that we get content. Oh, and I think, I mean, this, this new use of StreamYard by us is a perfect example of the, well, the technology was changing. We knew it was going to happen. We looked at all the different options that were out there. Shell did a whole lot of homework, um, looked at the, the cost benefits of some of these things. And then we also have had dress rehearsals playing with the new technology and finding out all the advantages it offers. So we are actually practicing what it is that you've been preaching, Shell. 
Oh well, thanks. I, and I did now get a chance to do the the close up. Your your full screen there, Brad. Yeah, I thought it you know, worked so well. Jeffrey, um, the fourth estate traditional media is looking at new forms. Um, you know, one of the more common is take in, instead of being driven by commerce and subscription and ad sales that they take a no nonprofit version. And, and you mentioned that frame is investigative. Um, that's happening a lot with investigative journalism that now it is, they form as a nonprofit um, to where they can accept donations and that they fund investigative journalism. And frequently besides that entity sharing it, they also have partners and share it with other media. The concern there is that, and I referred to the traditional media as the fourth estate initially for a reason. It's supposed to be separate and apart. It's not supposed to be a, a branch of government. It's not supposed to be a commercial interest that's profit driven, and it's not supposed to be a nonprofit. It's supposed to be outside of that. So it can give us um, honest, truth seeking, objective facts and reporting on those three other estates. So it's concerning, even some of the better nonprofit approaches have had trouble because in the nonprofit arena, it's normal for a donor to uh, request to be anonymous. But that's a problem when someone writes a big check to an investigative news outlet, and then they happen to investigate someone that is um, oppositional to them or, or contrary to them. So um, it's interesting to see these things happen. I, I, I still think we, we need to support um, and have a very robust fourth estate when it comes to media. And I threw up the uh, URL to frame for anybody who's interested. Another nifty feature of StreamYard. Uh, to take a comment and put it on the screen. Um, but yeah, I, I had a list here and we're down to our last uh, three and a half minutes. But uh, I talked about, I, I was interested in talking about games. Uh, Fortnite, people are now doing marketing within Fortnite. Uh, they're doing marketing within Twitch. Uh, I, I listed augmented reality. Uh, Facebook has just opened up AR Spark, its platform, uh, to anybody who's developing marketing tools on Instagram. So we're going to see more augmented reality in, in those marketing tools. Documentaries. I just watched a, uh, an 11-minute documentary. Uh, this was from Driscoll's, which is the company that distributes strawberries and, and blueberries and the like. I think they do about 70% uh, of these uh, types of produce in, in, in the US. Uh, and they did a documentary and it looked very much like a professional documentary. Um, and it was uh, three of the farms that supply them with strawberries and the like, talking about the fact that they would go out of business if they couldn't use undocumented labor. And interestingly, they didn't put this on YouTube. They didn't put it anywhere online. They're showing it at film festivals. They're showing it at universities, uh, only where they can have a face-to-face -face dialogue after it's been shown. Uh, but I see this as a trend, uh, this idea that companies are producing documentaries uh, that, that look like professional films. Uh, I had uh, Instagram stories, chat bots, um, interactive video, um, and now we have voice. Um, I, have, I can't tell you how many articles I've read about how to optimize for voice uh, for the Amazon Echo system, the Google home system, whatever it might be. Um, so all of these things are changing the landscape. And I mean, ad ad adapting to all of this sounds like a, a, a fairly daunting challenge. Indeed. I'm, I'm sure you, I'm glad you didn't mention her name because you would yeah, she would have <laughs> <laughs> made devices in each one of our homes and offices jump to life. Uh, there is a some joke that I read not long ago that said the husband was talking to the wife in very hushed tones, and she said, why are you talking so quietly? He said, I'm afraid Mark Zuckerberg might be listening. And the wife laughed uncomfortably. The husband laughed uncomfortably. Alexa laughed uncomfortably. Siri laughed uncomfortably. Um, and so I think this whole technology, uh, we sort of back to the the how do we bring this stuff in? What do you do? Uh, how do we play a role? The other person I, I just watched not long ago that was sort of like the wow, uh, more people need to read and, and hear um, Zena Tufeki. If you uh, want to follow her, Z E Y N E P, Zena 
Tufeki, T-U-F-E-K-C-I, probably mispronounced it, but she calls herself a techno-sociologist. And a lot of it is the use of technology in society, maybe not necessarily just corporate, but some of the, what is it that artificial intelligence can do that's a plus, but also what are some of the downsides of some of these things that we're beginning to adapt. So um, when it comes to that, whether it's the AI, whether it's the bots that you're talking about, the voice jail systems, I, I love, it used to be that, uh, you know, when you called in and you got, you know, your call is very important, please hang on, you're the 27th caller, we should get to you in 45 minutes. That was one jail system. Now they've got the one that says, if you'd like to leave your number, you won't lose your place in line, we'll call you back. And then the call comes when you're in another meeting and you're back to zero. So do you listen for the 23 minutes or do you have it call you back and start from zero? So a lot of technology that's helping us and not so much. Right. Well, we are out of time. Uh, so thank you, everybody, for a great conversation. I do want to let everyone know the next episode of Circle of Fellows will be on Thursday, September 19th, episode 49 on the topic of making your company change ready. Uh, Brad, you'll be back with us for that one. Uh, and joining you and me will be Amanda Hamilton Atwell, uh, coming in from South Africa, Mark Schumann from Houston, and Jim Schaefer from Maryland. So looking forward to that one. Uh, change is a topic that uh, I think we all as communicators have to deal with. I mean, change uh, without communication just doesn't happen. Uh, so look forward to uh, talking to everybody then. Uh, thank you, everybody who was watching live. Uh, this will be available as a uh, video replay uh, almost immediately on YouTube and over the weekend as an audio podcast. So have a good rest of your week, everyone. Thanks, Thanks Shell. Thanks, Shell. John, Stacy. Thank you.